Hey everybody, welcome to Atticus Live, where we drink beer and talk about boats. Today we're going to be talking about buying or our five tips to buying a budget blue water sailboat. All right, so I'm Jordan. And I'm Desiree. And uh, we just want to let you guys know we are relatively new to cruising. We have learned a lot throughout our refit and our brief experience cruising, but uh, we definitely are not experts. So take everything that we have to say with a grain of salt. Cheers, guys. <laughs> also want to thank uh, Facebook user Melissa C., one of our patrons, Kevin Moran and his wife Angel, and a YouTuber, Patch, uh, for inspiring this week's episode. So um, Patch says on YouTube, today, if you were making the purchase, uh, what experience would you bring to the purchasing table? So hopefully uh, today's live stream will answer your questions, Patch. Hmm. All right. Oh, All right. that? Oh, okay. So, and then also we're going to start with uh, the Atticus Chug. Uh, every week we pick kind of like the most epic comment of the week. We actually forgot to do this last week. Sorry about that. Um, but this week's uh, Atticus Chug goes to Rob S. Uh, and he was kind of giving us a hard time for not posting one of our live streams, uh, which we have posted on our Patreon page. Um, we, it's called, if you want to find it, it's called, uh, live stream fail. <laughs> so, uh, you'll see why we didn't post it there. I had food poisoning, <laughs> so I was a little, so, I was a little down. Yeah, so anyways, Rob S. says, oh man, I invited 173 people over, roasted a wild boar a la Hawaiian style, had three kegs of your finest microbrew, brought in Matchbox 20 for entertainment, uh, and bought a huge 72-inch flat screen TV to watch your live feed, and it didn't happen. So, sorry about that, Rob. Best, but you can find it on Patreon, uh, on Patreon, and uh, thanks for giving us a hard time. <laughs> That's right, but Rob, this is what I have to say about your comment. Awesome! Totally awesome! Cool. Man, <laughs> technology, dude. So excited about this. Woo! Okay. All right, and as always, uh, we're, you guys can go ahead and ask questions as we're going through our five tips, um, but we're going to pound through those questions, or the tips first, and then we'll address your questions afterwards. So feel free to ask questions, but if we're not responding, it's because we're just going to get through these first. Okay, cool. Also, hey, uh, we're, we've been doing a lot of really fun stuff on our Facebook page lately, all kinds of really cool little competitions and sweepstakes and stuff, so if you guys want to have a really fun time with us, head over and check us out on Facebook, too. Okay, so we're going to start with tip numero uno. Desiree, go ahead. Okay, tip number one, slow down. Do your research and look at lots of boats. Um, and most importantly, this is really hard, because, and we know because we didn't do this, but really try to separate uh, the emotional experience of like, wow, I'm buying a sailboat to sail around the world. Try to separate that excitement from uh, the decision to buy the boat. Um, we, again, Atticus was the first sailboat I had ever stepped foot on. Uh, it is a blue water boat, so, um, you know, we didn't go in totally blind. And I did do a <laughs> ton of research. Um, but we were so excited about, um, you know, you, we get, we got into the V-berth and, uh, you know, lay down in the V-berth and it was just, I could, we could both just imagine sailing off into the sunset and we were hasty. Um, and because of it, we spent three years in the boatyard fixing up Atticus, getting her ready for circumnavigation. Um, so whenever we meet couples who are uh, on the market for a boat, we always try to tell them like, okay, slow down a little bit, make sure you're doing your research and look at a lot of boats before you decide on the one. <laughs> That's right. And the only thing I would add to that is that, um, you know, you, you, there are so many resources out there, so that's what you should be taking your time doing. Just even if you think that you find the best boat and it's only been like a week or two, just hold out for a couple months. Keep finding boats, going to look at them, and saying no. Like, tell yourself you're going to find boats and say no and not buy them for at least a couple months. And during that time, there's some really good resources, yachtworld.com, you know what I mean? You can really get a sense for what different boats cost over time. Um, Adam Voyages has a really great list of like budget blue water sailboats. And they're, they're smaller boats and they're more traditional boats, but that's what makes them really friendly for people on a budget. So he's got a really, really comprehensive list. Um, we have, uh, a link to it down in the description below. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, Facebook groups and uh, bluewaterboats.org is a good website. Um, so all that stuff we'll put in the description. So make sure you're doing a ton of research, reading books, read your Don Casey, 
uh, read your uh, 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 Beth Leonard, all of these people while you're doing that preliminary search. And also, just try to get on as many boats as you can. If you have any cruising friends, see if you can do a little passage with them or a little sail with them. Um, try to start racing at your local sail club. Um, also, try to do a charter if you have the finances. There are a ton of YouTube bloggers who actually charter out their boats, so you can go live with them and see what it's like to really um, you know, be out on the water. So um, you need to just kind of make sure you fall in love with it because if you are going to be getting a budget blue water boat, it probably means you're going to be putting some work into it. So to kind of like fuel your motivation while you're in the boatyard, it's nice to have those memories of like, this is why I'm doing it. So we didn't do that. The first sailboat I ever went on was Atticus and then we went straight to the boatyard and Jordan put a grinder in my hand and told me to start standing yeah welcome um, to cruising <laughs> and you know like i had so many emotional breakdowns because i didn't really understand why i was doing any of the work that i was doing um i was really just trusting that jordan uh was right when he said it would be worth it <laughs> and so it was probably two years into our refit when we when we finally took atticus out for a sale and it was worth it so but it's nice to um have that experience so you can hold on to that yeah exactly get out and have a good time on a sailboat cruising <laughs> somehow for a small amount of time so that you've got that in your mind so that when you are sanding with the respirator <laughs> on and it's hot and you're it, you're just miserable like you'll have that to kind of look back on i had that desiree didn't and it was really hard for her in particular and jordan also got into racing in san diego and some people maybe are intimidated about how that works so I thought you could talk a little bit about how easy it is actually to get on a racing team. Yeah, definitely. First of all, real quick, a couple of people, Off Planet Event and mm. uh, and uh, Ashley, Shutter, Ashley Shutter, two of our really good friends, were, made a really good point that uh, the whole say no to the boat and just stay in the market for a long time also applies to dating, which is really <laughs> funny. Probably a good point, you know what I mean? Like, hold off from that commitment. <laughs> Um, all right, but anyway, so yeah, sailing or getting into racing is pretty simple, and I want to—I'll keep this really brief because it's off topic. But just if you live in an area where there is any kind of racing that happens, go to your local yacht club and just ask people. Um, I even got into it because the San Diego Yacht Club had a section of their website where you could sign on saying that you want a crew on a boat. I signed on. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, and like that weekend, somebody. Uh, messaged me and said that I, they could use me as rail meat, you know what I mean? Just literally ballast moving back and forth on the boat. And I learned to sail from racing, so that's a really cool way to to, to get that experience. And I didn't know this, uh, I've always, I was a little bit intimidated by the culture of like racing, but you could literally go in not knowing anything, any of the terminology, um, and they'll, a lot of the times they'll welcome you with open arms, if you're willing to learn. Yeah. Totally. Um, all right, so you want to move on to tip number two. Tip number two. Uh, assume any boat you look at is a POS <laughs> and be ready not to buy it. <laughs> That's right. So the POS rule <clears throat> is, it. I see too many people like, see a boat and have the opposite experience. They, they see it as way better than it actually is. They have those like goggles on where they're, they're not looking at the boat, they're looking at the South Pacific. You know what I mean? Like they're looking at palm trees and hammocks and all that. When you go in and look at a boat, assume it's a piece of shit. That's the POS rule. <laughs> that way you're looking for uh, evidence that it's not. And that's where you want to be, is you want to actually be in the state of mind where you're asking the boat owner and while looking around the boat, you're actually looking for evidence to convince you that it's not a piece of shit. Um, and if you just have that mindset, it'll keep you out of a whole lot of problems. And especially if you're looking at a boat that has like a very low price, um, you know, be a little bit skeptical about why it has such a low price, you know, as, as exciting yeah. it is that it has a great price kind of you know have those gears turning as to why that yeah. could be but you know at the same time it could be a great deal you know that has happened a lot of times so we don't want to like throw salt on your dreams um but that's just like our initial reaction because we rushed into atticus and it was a very difficult decision <laughs> yeah and speaking of which thomas mcfarland was asking any regrets about your boat choice we'll kind of be getting into that a little as we go through these rules and then after uh, once we open it up for a Q&A, we'll definitely talk about that. So stick around, Thomas, and, and we will get to that for sure. All right, tip number three. Tip number three, is... size matters. Nice. That's right. <laughs> you, you always assumed it did. Well, you were correct. Um, okay, so 
Am I talking about this one? Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, this is a great uh, little like passage that I read uh, while researching this video. It's from Beth Leonard's book, uh, The Voyager's Handbook, which I think is probably my number one uh, video for preparing to cruise and book. learning. I'm sorry, book <laughs> about preparing to cruise and learning to cruise. Um, and the what she says is for each. 10 foot increase in boat length, the hours spent on maintenance double and boat related costs triple. All right, so I want that to really, really sink in, right? For every additional 10 feet of boat length, your maintenance time doubles and your cost for everything. That means the initial cost, that means the refit cost, that means the annual maintenance costs is tripled with each additional 10 feet. So that means that a 30 footer like Atticus is half as much maintenance as a 40 footer. And the 40 footer is three times more expensive to buy, refit and operate. I mean, that is a huge difference. So um, what I like to call this is, uh, it's a different mindset. It's sort of like the POS rule. A lot of people, have a mindset of getting the biggest boat that they can afford, which sort of makes sense in a way. But with boats, because of this 10 foot long rule, you know, I mean, additional 10 foot rule, it makes sense to do the opposite. Have the mindset of getting the smallest boat that you're comfortable with. That way, your finances are going to thank you. You're going to have a ton more money and time to actually cruise, to actually enjoy yourself and travel and see the places where you are, as opposed to spending all of your time and money maintaining the boat. Mm -hmm. So that's a really big one. And we are, we're gonna be holding off our comments and shout outs for later, um, but uh, In the Fiber does say, but the comfort, is it worth it? Um, and we talk about that a lot. Um, and the short answer to that is, um, for us, we're really happy with our decision because we're able to uh, financially maintain ourselves. So if we were in a bigger boat, we'd be like not above ground uh, or we wouldn't be floating financially right now. <laughs> yeah. Now, but uh, in in the fiber, um, that's a really good question, though. And I, I would say that what my rule is that I'm suggesting is buy the smallest boat that you're comfortable with. Right, so the comfort factor is the determining factor with the size, in my opinion. So don't go for the biggest boat you can afford. Go with the smallest boat that you're comfortable with. Okay. All right. Tip Rule number four. Number four is learn the boat design elements of a blue water sailboat. Yes. And so I'm going to go over a couple of these elements with this super fancy graphic that I made today. Oh man, this is exciting. Okay, so cheers. Gosh, cheers. All right. Mm. So guys, we are going to talk about the design elements of these, these three boats, okay? They're very comparable in a lot of ways. Um, and we're gonna talk about what makes them different and how that matters to your choice of a blue water boat. And just to be clear, we're pretty much going over two good boats and one not so good boat for blue water cruising. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about keel design. So in my opinion, for a budget blue water boat, you have three, or really you have two different keel designs to consider for a budget blue water boat. You can go for expensive blue water boats that don't fall into these two categories, but for a budget blue water boat, I think these are the two categories that you've got. You've got something akin to what we have, the Ally C-130, and if you look, the keel, which is way down there, that side profile image, you can see that it has a full keel, which means that the bow continues to swoop down all the way to the bottom of the boat, to the transom where the rudder is hung. So you've got a full keel with a transom hung rudder. Um, that, then the second option is below me and it is a, gosh, I'm gonna forget what I called it, modified keel, oh boy. So th it's a modified keel. So it's kind of in between. It's not a complete full keel, but the keel is substantially connected to the rest of the hull. And as you can see, the rudder has a skeg, 
that protects it. So there's a bit of the hull that comes down in front of the rudder. So if you were to run aground, the skeg would transfer that load to the rest of the hull and hopefully leave your rudder relatively undamaged. And then finally, you have a fin keel with a spade rudder. And in my opinion, that combination is just not suited uh, to be a, a budget blue water boat because that rudder is super, super vulnerable. There is nothing protecting that rudder. If you go, run aground, that rudder is going to bend the shaft, possibly foul the bearing. Um, your steering is gonna go is is gonna start having a hard time. I mean, there's a chance that if you run aground hard enough with a spade rudder like that, you will lose steerage, um, which is a huge problem. And while we've been in Isla Mujeres, Mexico, that was m most of the money that I made was uh, helping to build new rudders. We built four, me, uh, me and our neighbor built four new rudders this summer for cruisers who ran aground in Cuba and elsewhere, or even not even ran aground, like, you know, just out at sea, ran into something or just had some large forces on the rudder and damaged their rudders, barely limped over here to Isla Mujeres and then had to get a huge repair job. Um, if you have a modified keel or the full keel, your rudder is going to be protected. And if you go with the full keel, which is like what we went with, your rudder is extremely protected. In fact, it, I, you would have to be going backwards to damage your rudder. Um, you'd have to be going in reverse. Um, Type of so, steering? Uh, the next is, uh, yeah, so that's the full keel, the protected rudder, and the type of steering. So. Uh, I'm a big fan of tiller steering because there's so little that can go wrong. Now again, if you're not a budget cruiser, go with a wheel. It's so much easier and, you know, it looks better in pictures, you know, you're just <laughs> like, hey, I'm the captain. Um, but a tiller is more practical and safer if you're on a budget. There's so much less that can go wrong. Um, Finally, or not finally, the next one is split sail plan. As you can see, both the Pacific Creek, uh, the Pacific Seacraft 30 and the Allied Seawind have split sail plans. The Pacific Seacraft is a cutter, so it has two head sails, and then the Allied Seawind is a catch. The, the reason I'm a big fan of split sail plans for blue water cruising boats is that none of your sails are too large to handle. Um, you're able to split up the, the effort um, so that on a catch, you've got, uh, you know, redundant spars handling that load. And on a cutter, you don't have a redundant spar, but you've got redundant head stays, as well as when you put the smaller head sail up, you're bringing that uh, center of effort further inboard, which is an important thing from, a, from just a seaworthiness standpoint. Um, so split sail plans, I think, give you the versatility and extra safety that you need when you're going offshore. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, safe deck area uh, is a big thing. So you want to make sure that you've got enough room on your side decks to get forward to the foredeck. You've got to make sure that you've got enough room on the foredeck to work, to wrestle that uh, cruising shoot down when the wind picked up and you didn't think it was going to. Um, you And you also really need to find a boat that has a substantial bulwark or at least a really substantial tow rail. But in my opinion, bul bulwarks are much, much better. That's what's going to make the difference of you sliding down the deck when you're heeled over at 30 degrees in the middle of the Indian Ocean. That bulwark is what your feet are going to catch on to. And it's going to mean the difference between you being safely inside again in a couple minutes or trying to pull yourself up by your tether. And did you want to talk about that displacement ratio? Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, something I did just skip over. And in fact, someone was talking about, um, you know, comfort, how that's important. Um I also want to talk about the uh, the the sailing the the boat design triangle in my opinion. So on that triangle, you've got there you go, <laughs> Zoltan. Um, on that triangle, the top is comfort, one side is seaworthiness, and then the other side is speed. And the whole theory behind that is the moment you affect one, you you uh, deform that triangle. So if you want to increase comfort you're going to decrease both speed and seaworthiness. If you want to increase comfort but keep the seaworthiness the same, then you're going to dramatically decrease the speed. 
So you can't affect one of those elements, speed, comfort, and seaworthiness, without affecting at least one or if not both of the other two. Um, and that is almost always true. And in my opinion, if you're going on a budget blue water cruise and you're looking for a boat, you really need to prioritize seaworthiness. Whether you want to prioritize speed or comfort after that is totally up to you. But the seaworthiness aspect is what's going to keep you safe, alive, and still moving when you want to keep seeing new places. Did you want to talk about traditional versus performance cruises? Sure. The last thing I'll talk about with this tip, and we'll go back to this, is, uh, well, actually, no, we'll go we'll go over here again. So if you look at the Allied Sea Wind, this is a more traditional design, right? That full keel, it's got a, it's real heavy for its size and for its sail area, so it's going to be a little bit slower. That's a traditional design, and those are really based off of how they were building boats when they were making them out of wood. Um, so, you know, a lot of the boat builders in like the 60s and 70s were boat builders that built out of wood and they just tr crossed over into fiberglass. So they brought a lot of that, those same sort of philosophies and concepts into their boat design. Um, the, the advantage of a traditional design is that A, for its length, it's going to be a more comfortable ride because of its weight. It weighs more, so each wave will affect the boat less than if it had weighed less. Um, so it's gonna be more comfortable for its size, which is good for any of you that are looking for a budget blue water boat. Smaller boats are generally less comfortable, but if it's heavier, that makes up for some of that, that problem. Um, also, um, the traditional boats, really they had more, those boat builders had more time. They, they were drawing from centuries of knowledge, right? Boat, wooden boat builders had accrued centuries of trial and error knowledge. Once we started getting into designs like the Pacific Seacraft 31, where it's a more like performance cruiser, um, a, a newer style, that was a large leap in boat design in only like a decade or two of fiberglass experience. So they ran into problems that they didn't foresee. Um, so a lot of the newer, non-traditional performance designs and it ended up having some flaws that the boat builders didn't initially plan for. That's not to say that they're not the, a good choice. In a lot of ways, a, uh, a, a more modern hull is a better choice as long as you're protecting your rudder and that keel is substantially connected to the hull. Then you get stuff like the Hunter 32. That's like, you know, they, they, they totally you know, gave up on all those traditional philosophies and just said, let's build the, a boat that's as fast and comfortable as possible. Let's totally sacrifice the seaworthiness. And that's what you get with things like the Hunter 32. If you own a Hunter, that's awesome. They're great day sailors. They're great weekend boats. You can do them in like a little protected area, no problem, but they're just not blue water boats. Um, okay, so that is it for tip number four. All right, what do we got next, Desiree? Tip number five, which is get a survey. <laughs> yes. Um, we, especially if you're completely new to, especially if this is your first sailboat, um, like it's, you can read as many books uh, as you can. We read a lot of books about what to look for on the boat when you go look at it. Um, Don Casey has a really great section, but there's a difference between reading about like delamination in the, in the deck um, and and then also having the experience of uh, understanding what it sounds like and what it feels like. So, um, you know, if you don't have the experience, uh, be honest with yourself about that and get a surveyor who um, knows a lot about boats that you really trust um, to help you figure out if the boat is actually in good condition to take it off uh, for a blue water cruise. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would say even if you've got a really small budget, if you don't know much about boats, get a survey and that's why we made this a rule all on its own is because we didn't get a proper survey on Atticus and I really wish we would have um, and I see a lot of people that are in the budget blue water market that just say I don't have the money for it it's so expensive it's worth it yeah. it is totally worth it get that survey and only get a surveyor that has a really good reputation because there's so many crackpots out there you know, you just you can't you can't just rely on anybody's opinion. Yeah, and as a side note, um, if you are buying a boat, it's always a good idea to get it hauled out and take a look at the hull 
um, or take it out for a sale, turn the engine on, run the water, um, bust out the sails, um, just like look and touch, look at and touch everything. Um, even though hauling out a boat is really expensive, if you're going to be owning that boat, you're going to be glad that you invested the money to see if there are any problems under the waterline. Um, yeah, cause, because you could inherit a boat with a ton of blisters or cracking or who knows what. It's complete mystery. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And, you know, uh, no job. What up, buddy? How's it going? Makes a really good point. He bought three boats with no survey. I mean, if you know a lot about boats, don't think I'm trying to tell you to get a survey, right? I'm specifically speaking to people that were like us when we bought Atticus, where we did not have the, the knowledge uh, necessary to ma make a, a quality survey our, of our own. If you want to see me pretend like I was able to survey Atticus when we bought the boat, <laughs> go back to episode. episode one or two <laughs> yeah. um, from season one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty funny. I remember Jordan's like hitting the deck with his like screwdriver and he's like, you hear that? It sounds like hollow. And I was like, hmm. Is that good? <laughs> Where I, and I'm like, I thought I had found a couple spots of core rot. 50% of the deck was rotten. Yeah, it's crazy. Which, if you're buying an older boat, um, which I didn't talk about this, but that is another thing, is if you're buying a fiberglass boat, uh, be careful about boats from, like, the late 70s and 80s because, the, because of the oil embargo at that time, the boat builders were using less... Uh, resin and therefore there were more air pockets in their layups and osmotic blistering can be a big problem. Boats from the 60s and early 70s are actually preferable to boats from the 80s generally. So don't uh, be concerned about a boat being old necessarily. The hull is probably better for it, but uh, definitely be careful about things like core rot because old boats almost always guaranteed have totally rotted balsa cords. And it's nasty. And it <laughs> smells bad when you cut into that. Yeah. And fixing it is a nightmare. Again, another one. If you want to watch us opening up our deck, check out uh, some of our Atticus updates back in the day. All right, so those are our tips. We're going to go uh, through your comments and pick out some questions to answer. So Thomas McFarland said, did you actually pay for your Marina Jack mooring ball? And yes, we did. We, uh, we decided to splurge, even though it was really expensive. Um, because we had kind of like a sentimental uh, connection with Marina Jack, we went there. Um, after we went there after we had bought Atticus, and that was where we drank and opened up our first bottle of champagne when we bought Atticus. So we just decided, you know, let's just splurge and do it. Um, Marco two fifty says, "Do you ever get used to seasickness? Uh, love the vids, keep them coming." Um, I would say uh, I'm the one who always talks about seasickness because Jordan doesn't really feel it as much as I do. Um, but I've been living and working on boats for the last five years of my life. Um, and I don't know if it's something about the way that my brain works. Uh, um, but I constantly get seasick. Um, and I've, I, you know, people say once you get really, really seasick, um, it'll be out of your system forever. Um, so I've tried to go out on like really rough days. I've been out on, on trips where I'm throwing up over the side. And I still continuously get seasick uh, pretty consistently. So um, the way that I look at seasickness is kind of like something that um, I just I just understand that it'll end, um, and I just kind of have to suck it up and uh, deal with it in the moment that it happens. Uh, and then I've also realized there are some things um, that affect my seasickness. So I definitely make sure I get a full night of sleep the day before. Um, I definitely don't drink uh, alcohol the night before. Um, if I'm sick, uh, I'll pretty much always get seasick. Um, don't eat greasy food. Yeah, I don't know that, if that applies for me, but because with my seasickness, I don't really feel it in my stomach. It's, it's like a head thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's different for everyone. Um, some people do get used to it over time. Um, and, you know, there are some days when I go out on the water and there's somebody throwing up on the boat and I feel fine. So it's just, for me, it's just this big mystery. <laughs> and, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but wouldn't you say that after, like, being at sea for a couple days, you get used to it? Like, when you're doing it very regularly, you become accustomed. Yeah, yeah, custom. I kind of, like, yeah, I go through this, like, upward trend, and then it kind of, like, uh, gets to a point, and it doesn't get worse or better than that. <laughs> so, well, it gets but a little bit better. I will say, in my experience with Desiree, like, if we're at a dock or at anchor for a long period of time, that first day, she gets seasick. 
But after we're traveling every day, moving every day, she very rarely gets seasick. So I think most of it is just frequency, like r recent frequency. Like how often are you out on the water in the last month? Yeah. All right. So Thomas McFarland says, where are you guys? Cuba? Oh. Well, wait, I'm sorry. Real quick. I wanted to say hi to uh, where uh, Kennedy. What's up, Kennedy? How's it going? You're asking if Tiffany is still here? If you're referring to uh, Phil's daughter, Tiffany, that works at uh, here at the marina in the restaurant? Yes, Tiffany is here. She's um, awesome. But what up, Kennedy? Good to see you here. Um, and then Robert Rafter says, Hi, kids. Best wishes from Dublin, Ireland. What's up, Robert? How are you? <laughs> I just wanted to say we are potentially talking about sailing up to Ireland for this next coming summer. So we'll see if we do that or not. But if we do, definitely get a hold of us, Robert, and we'd love to try and meet up with you. That'd be awesome. Or get some tips. And then Marco says, size matters, story of my life. Marco, me too. It's small but cute. That's the idea, right? Small <laughs> but cute. Can I answer the question about where we are? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So we are not in Cuba. Um, we're, we ended up in Isla Mujeres. And um, if you watch our episodes, you'll you'll get the whole, whole story of how we ended up here. Um, but we've been here for about nine or ten months. Um, and we've been working, doing sewing jobs, maintenance jobs. Um, and we're at this marina and we exchange our boat rent uh, for work. So we've been uh, pretty busy just working here. All right, next question. No job says better glass before 1975. It had uh, more oil in it. Hence why when the oil embargo hit, they cheapened glass and its petroleum uh, details usage and causes blister. Yep, you got it, buddy. Totally true. And I think we just got a tip from J Jake Lamson. Thank you. Because awesome. I straightened my hat. Jake, oh, I really? appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for looking out for me. Mrs. Golan. She, uh, that's my uh, mother-in-law. She does not like me wearing the hat. Sorry, Ms. Golan. My hair would, would definitely look worse or else I would <laughs> love to acquiesce. Um, but, uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, do you want to look up one of those real quick? Yeah, so we also have a bunch of questions from um, previous, uh, from a couple weeks ago from our Facebook page and YouTube. Um, a really good one we got from Ice Spock. He's on YouTube and Facebook. And he says, I was wondering, what's your plan? I mean, really, do you have any time schedule at all? What happens after five years? Back to work, family on board, and homeschooling? Um, I'm interested in how cruisers do that, how the transition has been from steady life pay to play and sway. Um, and then kind of along the same vein, Jorge Campos said, I would love to see more sailors explain the motivation behind them moving from their life, moving their life from land to sea. Um, I know it's not all roses and it's a decision not to be taken lightly. Um, but uh, just wanted to hear you guys talk about it a little bit. So um, I would say for us, the transition from um, moving from land to sea kind of happened before we bought Atticus because we were both working on yachts. So um, we both didn't have many possessions and were used to uh, moving around a lot. Um, so and yeah, so that was kind of our transition. And then both of us got into yachting from different, uh, from, from land. So that was a big decision. And I would say the reason we both got into it was because yachting had a lucrative, um, uh, kind of like safety net. So if everything went, you know, so it wasn't that big of a risk. Um, uh, yeah. And so as far as our plan, like our five year, 10 year plan, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, totally. And, but just to elaborate on that, um, although we were working on yachts, it was a, it still was a big transition for us. I think the key with, with ours, it, with our situation, I Spock, is that, um, we, we were both committed to travel. Yeah. In fact, it was one of the things that we liked about each other when we met. I think out of all of the crew on the boat we were working on, we were both the two most committed people to traveling as like a lifestyle and almost like as a belief system in a way. Um, and so it, moving aboard the boat was just a means to end for us. And you know, it was, it's tough. It's a smaller accommodation it is, it is it's, it's less convenient than living ashore, but it accomplishes our major life goal. So I think for anyone that has that overarching goal of like, see the world and like get outside of the, sort of consumerism, like positive feedback loop. For anyone in that situation, moving onto a boat 
is is the the small part of it, if you will, right? Like it's such a relatively small sacrifice if you want it bad enough. Um, but our our long term plan is to just cruise indefinitely um, because that's kind of our life goal right now. Um, I I'd call it maybe our ten year plan. Yeah, definitely. Is to just keep cruising, go wherever it's exciting. We're super super inspired by Lynn and Larry Party, and their phrase was always "as long as it's fun," mm -hmm. and that's kind of how we're looking at it. Like until we get super over it, we're just gonna keep doing it. And in fact, if we can kind of make this whole you know lifestyle of sailing and sharing our adventures with you guys sustainable then we might even try and uh, have a kid while we're underway as well, um, which will be an interesting experience on a 30-foot boat. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've met, we met a lot of people that have done it, and it seems totally, totally doable. Yeah, and boat um, kids, in our experience, are pretty awesome little yeah. ones. They're awesome. Yeah, and that little boy would be one tough little dude, wouldn't he? That little girl? Desiree wants to genetically engineer our child to be a girl. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Depends where the technology goes in a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like our um, financial plan, um, we're really excited about Patreon as like a new opportunity to kind of make Project Atticus a career. So um, we're really trying to make Project Atticus our full-time job. So um, that goes into our... Uh, our 10-year plan. So we'd like to continue just sharing our life and um, being able to make enough uh, money on the side to continue doing doing what we're doing. Um, okay. Um, I had another question up there. But, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, so we'll go on to another question uh, that I had from uh, people beforehand, and then you can find one mm -hmm. scrolling. Um, a lot of people have been asking about uh, a video on our weather facts uh, that Jordan mentioned uh, a couple times, and just want to let you guys know that is coming soon. Jordan has been paying off uh, our dock rent for the last two weeks, and before that he was in the boatyard. Um, I've been sewing, but we've both kind of um, decided for the next couple of weeks we're going to turn away jobs and focus on making that video. Um, and focusing on Project Atticus. So cheers, everybody. That's super exciting. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we are officially n not taking on more work right Woo! now, which is really exciting. <laughs> I mean, we're working our butts off, but we're not working on boats and sewing, which is really yeah, exciting. Yeah, and we're really excited to finally have the time to just, like, sit down and have meetings and make uh, timelines of what, what kind of videos we want to add to our repertoire what yeah. we want to do for live feeds we're thinking about doing collaborations down the line uh with other youtube channels so right that should be really exciting yeah but yeah i mean i actually got to have time to research for this live stream today <laughs> which is awesome right <laughs> normally i'm just like ah, this is what i think <laughs> this time i actually got to do a little bit of research which is great um okay so i was going to answer um uh to, to ted smith Ted, cheers, buddy. Thank you for coming. Really glad to have you. Um, asked, how do you get your spouse to buy a boat when they don't want to? And I've said this before, but the trick is to lie. Um, <laughs> and I will follow that up by saying, um, I wish Jordan had um, kind of allowed me to fall in love with sailing and uh, like kind of like the liveaboard lifestyle before we bought our boat together. Um, somehow he suckered me into it. He's very charming, but I struggled a lot through the refit because I didn't know why I was doing it a lot of the times. So I always tell couples where one partner's a little bit hesitant is to try to charter a boat um, and make it perfect. You know, get the food taken care of, get a get a captain to route out your plans. Uh, I mean, to map out your route so that there's no stress for either of you. So that way you can say like, this is what we're aspiring to do. Um, let's do it. And yeah. if they, if they're going to love it, um, this is, this is the way to figure out if they're going to love it. If they, if they don't love that, then they probably won't love all the other kind of crappy parts of live, of the live aboard lifestyle and buying a boat and refitting it and yeah. figuring out everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would say that in sailing, um, 10% of the time it's absolute bliss. 10% of the time, it's absolute terror. And then 80% of the time, it's just kind of like, meh, 
you know, like, because it's kind of boring, and you're, like, you feel a little seasick, but you're not really, and, you know what I mean, like, there's just, it's tough, it's a tough uh, sport to, to get into, um, but if you're going to try and get someone, like, a girlfriend or, or a spouse or something, you know, some other person who's not as invested as you, you need to show them that 10%, that, like, blissful 10%, and say, like, listen, like, this exists, and we could repeat this, and we could do it whenever we want, right? If, if they don't see that 10%, if they only see the 80, or, God forbid, the bad 10%, it's going to be very, very hard to convince them. But the problem is, is that 10% of blissful experience, it takes a lot of um, preparation and planning to make that happen. So, yeah, do like a vacation, like a week-long vacation in the BVI and rent a boat. It's a little pricey, but it's not that much more than a normal vacation to the BVI. Yeah. Or, like I said, there are a lot of vloggers out there. Uh, Trio Travels is another vlogger that was in uh, Isla Mujeres for a couple of months with us. They charter out their sailboat. You can hang out with them, see what it's really like. Um, and they're very, they have pretty affordable prices. Yeah. Um, so Jake Lampson. Well, can you talk about that? Chase, Chase Mixon. Oh, Chase, hey Chase, what's up, buddy? Thanks I really. For your email, by the way. Yeah, your email, your latest comment. You, I, we've been really enjoying your interaction, so thanks, buddy. Um, but he says, "Come on, at least twenty percent is perfect." Okay, <laughs> I will. I will admit. Let's call it twenty percent is perfect. Maybe like ten percent is terrifying, and then seventy percent is meh. We'll, <laughs> we'll call it that. All right, so we have to have a drinking game where every time you interrupt me. You have to do drink. I have to drink every time I interrupt you or do you have to drink every time I interrupt you viewers have to drink. yeah what do you guys think <laughs> yeah. who, who has to drink every time I interrupt her because oh, as him. you know I do it all the time yeah. you guys right. let us know yeah so Jake Lamson says is sailing single-handed a lot harder than multiple person sailing and then someone up about above I'm sorry I didn't see who it was asked um, is Atticus uh, equipped for solo sailing um, so I'll let you take that one yeah, so uh, first of all, Atticus is equipped <clears throat> to sail single-handed, um, mostly because of uh, our two autopilot systems, our electronic autopilot and our wind vane. Um, we don't have our mm -hmm. control lines, like we don't have halyards and reef lines coming aft to the cockpit, so you do actively have to go up to the mast to raise the sails. But if you're motoring, you can turn on the electronic autopilot hold your course, go up, and raise a sail. So yes, you can do everything single-handedly, and one person under normal to moderate conditions can handle all of the sails by hand without mechanical advantage. So um, yes, the boat is very, very well designed for single-handing, and I would say yes, it is a whole lot more work to single-hand, but it's sort of like, how would I put this? It's like, it's like asking is ballerina is being a ballerina difficult, right? Like yes, it's difficult, but if you've done it for 10 years, you can do it in your sleep, right? And so if you really know what you're doing, it's very easy, right? Like if you if you know exactly what process to take and what step to do and what action to take, then it's not that bad. But if you're kind of having to like figure it out, which even sometimes I find myself in that situation a lot. So I mean, it, it is more difficult, for sure. All right, and Jorge Campos asks, is it a 1963 Allied Sea Wind 30? And yes, it is. Yes, and it is. Somebody was asking, Ooh. it's draft? Four um, and a half feet. All right, and let's see. Any plans for a Project Atticus podcast when pl co collaborating with other cruisers? That's actually a really good idea. We have been talking about it. Um, now that we're kind of switching gears to Project Atticus for a couple of weeks where we, we can afford to not take on jobs for a little while, um, we're, we're thinking about kind of looking into the technology because if we do a podcast, we want it to be like really good. Um, so yeah, we are, that is kind of a, an idea in the future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, something that we're talking about doing, and we'd love your guys' feedback. So you can comment here about it. Also, you can comment on the video after a fact or just message us, Facebook, whatever. But we are talking about taking the audio from these live streams and turning them into podcasts as well. So let us know if you guys would like that. Um, and then we got a couple responses about uh, what to do if I interrupt Desiree, because it's going to happen a lot. And I am sorry. <laughs> it's a problem that I oh, have. Oh, I can get like a water bottle and just spray yeah, you. Yeah, good idea. That is a good idea. But also, um, 
A couple people, Colin Jacobs was saying, we all drink? I like that. <laughs> I think we should all drink when I interrupt Desiree. And then uh, Rob S. says, I'm going to have a drink every time Jordan interrupts. Winky face. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Here, everybody, drink time because I can be an a-hole. I feel like all that's right. just encouraging you. I like the spray bottle idea. <laughs> we'll do both. Okay. We'll do both. Okay. Um, all right. Thomas McFarland says, is one of you really organized? I'm having trouble organizing foods, tools, uh, food, tools, and clothes. Um, I would say um, we organize in a very different way. Um, and the way that we've kind of handled things on Atticus is I'm kind of in charge of the interior. And that goes for every single storage compartment. Uh, and I kind of get to organize it however I want. And um, if Jordan leaves something out that is not supposed to be there, I will tell him. Um, and then he does the same thing for the exterior. I wouldn't necessarily agree with his storing options or decisions on the exterior, but he's in charge, so we just do what he wants. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> it is pretty bad, but I don't have a lot of options. I mean, the I've got the two, uh, the two <clears throat> cockpit lockers, <clears throat> and literally you open those bad boys up. One of them is just all sales, and the other is just like, all my other crap and it's just like piled on top of each other which just like our drop down refrigerator like the concept being if it's n if it's just piled on top of each other you can fit a lot more stuff that way <laughs> it's a whole lot harder to get to what you want but you can fit a lot of stuff that way um but we're both stuffed up i know so dallas bob dallas dallas what's up buddy Drinking a soul for you. Here we go. He says, power consumption. Do you have enough with the wind generator? Will you solar up? Yeah, so uh, we we don't just have the wind generator. We have a uh, combination wind generator and solar panels. Right now, we have two 100-watt semi-flexible solar panels. And uh, when we have our sunshade set up, Desiree, the amazing sower that she is, um, put some uh, Velcro uh, uh, frames on top of our sunshade so that we can actually put the solar panels on top of the sunshade. And I actually got the design from uh, online and there's a, I'll have to find the company because I had a lot of questions while I was doing it and this company was awesome because I was essentially using their design but not buying their product. I was upfront about it. Um, but rather than being kind of weird about that, they helped me through every every stage of the process. So that was really cool. I would love to promote them. So I'll find that link and put it down below. Yeah, and, and then, I'm sorry. And then also when we take the sunshade down, um, we've been just strapping the, uh, the semi-flexible panels onto the deck. And then hopefully here, when I build our hardtop dodger thing, the official term, <laughs> um, we'll probably put the semi-flexible panels on top of that. So we're moving the panels a lot, but it's not that big of a deal because they're real lightweight and easy to move. Real quick, I need to do a... Uh, pirouette. <laughs> I need to do a pirouette real quick. Hold on. <laughs> and also, if um, you guys have asked a question uh, that we haven't answered yet, um, go ahead and ask it again. <laughs> While Jordan's pirouetting, um, I guess I'll mention we are looking for a moderator because we've been uh, really, really enjoying these live streams, but we've been getting a lot more people, and I guess I should say, and we've been getting a lot more people, um, and it's been a little bit difficult to try to make sure we're answering everyone's questions. Um, so if you're interested in becoming a moderator, please send me a message on our Facebook page. Um, all right. So I'll go ahead and answer another question from uh, Ann Aberdeen, uh, who is one of our patrons, and she says, in regards to videos, uh, to ideas for your videos, it would be kind of nice to see more of your day-to-day -day life. Shopping, errands, where you guys uh, go off the boat for fun, what the area looks like, the local culture. Um, and I guess we kind of wanted to explain uh, where we are with our videos, because there's we're about 10 months ahead of our videos. Um, so we two. two two months ahead of our video. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, like the lit. Okay, go on. Yeah, so we're in time about 10 months ahead of our videos. Um, so yes, uh, you'll see as we get to Isla Mujeres in Cuba, we do start focusing more uh, on the culture and our day to day lives. Um, but the videos that are posted now and that are going for the next couple of weeks, uh, we've already edited um, and uh, and filmed a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. So it don't don't feel like in the upcoming videos if we're not 
responsive to your ideas. It's not because we're not taking them into consideration. It's because we've already mm -hmm. edited our videos up to like episode 12 right now. Yeah, exactly. So you'll, you'll notice after episode 12, we're going to be changing things up quite a bit, taking all of your comments and uh, thoughts into consideration. All right, so another question is from Brad Ricks, um, and um, he sent us a message which um, really kind of hit home for us. He said, the one question that I simply can't find the answer to is this. I'm a highly skilled millwork, millwright and industrial controls and autom automation electrician. My question is this. I have a very, very small startup budget. Is there abundant opportunity to earn while I go? Yes, I'm totally scared of failure, as I'm sure you were. I want to circumnavigate in the next couple of years, and I'm just having a hard time with financial confidence. Any advice would be very helpful. Thanks very much. Uh, and I would say um, we actually made a video that we'll probably be posting in the next couple of weeks or months um, about working while you sail, and we would say definitely go for it. Um, and even consider Isla Mujeres as a good place to do it. Um, and we'll talk about in our video why Isla Mujeres is kind of ideal, but um, just kind of in summation, it has a really thriving cruiser community. Um, it's close enough to the United States where a lot of cruisers make it here, um, but it's too far to kind of go back to the United States for repairs. So people kind of end up here and they need someone who's competent to do fixes for them. And there's not a lot of competition here because Isla Mujeres is kind of like a party vacation place, um, a lot like Key West. Um, and there's a cruiser's net every morning so you can hop on the radio and find work. Um, so yeah, it is, uh, it is very feasible to cruise and make enough money to uh, kind of stay afloat. So uh, I would just say, um, Brad, you can do it. Uh, you just got to kind of take a leap. Um, Tony Auschwitz, who is one of our patrons, did the same thing um, in another industry. He left the United States and moved to Cozumel of all places, which is gorgeous. Um, and he started a scuba diving, scuba diving business over there. He's not, a, he's not cruising right now. Uh, he actually has a boat that's being built in the Philippines and he's going to be cruising in the next couple of years. Um, but he was saying, yeah, I can identify with like leaving everything behind like a big career and being really scared of how, how it's going to work out financially. But in our opinion, if you just work really hard and look for opportunities, they will come and you can do it. Yeah. And just to add to that, I think that if you are doing the whole budget cruising thing, in a way, you have a leg up on figuring out how to make money while cruising. And that's because you're going to have to do all this work yourself. <laughs> and uh, the, it's amazing. You know, I when we started cruising, I thought that we would run into, you know, a bunch of other cruisers that all really knew how to maintain their boats and keep them going. And whereas that probably is the case for about 40% of the cruisers that we meet, I'd say about 60% of the cruisers in Isla Mujeres really have no idea how to maintain their own boat on it, on, on anything but the most simple level. Um, so if you buy a fixer-upper, fix the darn thing up, take that time to buy the tools, you know, get all the tools necessary and and then get all the experience necessary to do a lot of these basic maintenance and refit jobs, then you're gonna be able to make good money doing it for other cruisers who are just totally screwed without you. And that's the other thing. We thought when we were gonna start working that it would be like we'd, we'd almost need to like, someone would do us a favor by hiring us. We were amazed about how many situations we found ourselves in where we were really doing someone a favor yeah um, they had no other option yeah and actually I said we're not accepting jobs uh, for the next couple of weeks but that is actually kind of a lie because one of our cruising friend or sailing friend liveaboard friends uh, came over to our boat with his big puppy dog eyes and asked me to fix his jib so I am gonna be doing that for him <laughs> um, and then let's see um, breaking news <laughs> Dave says breaking news they are time travelers <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> All right. Which one did you want to answer? Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Uh, I was going to say Mike Radecki. Um, is that H silent? Radecki? Uh, how did you choose the name Atticus? To be honest, uh, uh, if anybody has that question, 
definitely check out our very first trailer from season one. So the very first video from season one, and we kind of go into that. But uh, it's from To Kill a Mockingbird. The character Atticus Finch was, I always considered, probably the most inspirational fictional character uh, of, of all time. And the movie's pretty good, too. Gregory Peck. Gregory an amazing Peck. Atticus Finch. Whoa. Um, so, G Seal six, or sorry, J Seal 68 says, Going to start sailing eventually. Should I take a course, and what do you recommend since I live in your area, Bradenton, Florida? I would say, yes, take a course. Um, if, if you've never sailed before, um... I would take an ASA course, like ASA 101, like basic keel boating, that kind of thing. Um, I would avoid... Well, see, there's a double-edged sword there. You might want to take a course to learn how to sail like a really small boat, like a laser or a sunfish or, you know, something that's very basic. Because when you learn how to sail small boats, every tiny little action that you do has a huge result. So you get to, like, your brain starts to solidify the the cause and response of all of your different actions and those same actions uh, uh, you know uh, are the same with larger boats you know 50 60 footers it's the same concept um, and then I would say also take a sailing lesson um, and then also if you don't want to invest in a sailing lesson up front you could go to your like local yacht club I'm not really familiar with Bradenton um, my parents lived there, but I was kind of a transplant, so I never really lived there. Um, but if there's any sailing clubs, look for a racing team and just volunteer to help people, to help them out. Um, and then you can start kind of learning by osmosis and asking people around if they know an instructor. Um, so yeah, send us photos once you start uh, sailing. We'll, we'll be really excited to see your progression. Um, Jorge Campos says, what do you think of aluminum hulls? Um, I, I love metal boats. Uh, if they're if they're a custom built, if you're gonna build your own boat, if you're gonna hire a boat builder to build you a boat, I think metal boats are awesome. There's so many advantages, including aluminum. Um, I just think that if you're gonna buy one used, boy, you gotta either trust the person you're buying it from, or you gotta get the hull X-rayed. Yeah, you know I mean, because you could have major corrosion and electrolysis issues that you wouldn't necessarily find out about um, otherwise. So, in my opinion, if you're going for a used boat, a budget used boat, fiberglass is probably your best option. If you're going to buy a relatively new boat, uh, uh, metal is, is, is great. And then Bob Yandel says... Yandel. What's uh, up, Bob? Uh, what are your thoughts on on teak decks? Actually, ironically, a very similar uh, answer to the metal metal boats. I think teak decks are beautiful and very seaworthy and just salty as hell, which is great. But um, you only really, in my opinion, I would do a teak deck if I was building a boat new. If you're going, if you're in the used market, I would probably steer clear of teak decks because those teak decks are generally fastened to the hull, or I'm sorry, to the deck uh, with fasteners, with little screws, and those screws are going into the deck that has a core, so it has some sort of like balsa core generally. And over time, you're going to get leaks in those fasteners, and you're going to have massive coring problems. I'd say a teak deck on a sailboat that's over 15 years old is probably really suspect. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I love them. Uh, Thomas Golden just said tequila mockingbird. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Very Tommy. Good one. Love it. <laughs> and then also Ashley Shutter was saying a really good point earlier. It, she was saying the whole party uh, phrase of go small, go now. And I just couldn't agree with that more. You know, like if you guys hang out with us long enough, you're going to realize that that is definitely my philosophy on boating because we are budget because we are trying to do things now and not and not in some you know distant time in the future and, and i would say also like you don't really know how much you have to learn until you're actually doing it um so do whatever it takes to be able to just start doing it um because it's kind of hard to uh conceptualize all the lessons you're going to start learning until you actually jump in 
Um, all right, guys, if you've enjoyed tonight's live stream and you don't want to miss an episode in the future, text Atticus, A-T-T-I-C-U-S, to 43506. And also, we would really, really appreciate a thumbs up on this video if you've enjoyed it tonight. <laughs> and Jordan. Oh, and uh, oh, I wanted to just make a real quick special thanks to our patrons. We've been having a really awesome time over on our uh, patrons Facebook page lately. Um, what we were kind of talking about, Desiree and I, is um, if if there are people out there that want to kind of like financially support our dream, then what we want to do is give them the opportunity to store to steer the ship a little bit. Um, so we've been talking to them about possible cruising destinations that we might go to, how to, you know, do better job with our videos and and kind of in which way to like whenever we have a question, whenever we're talking about what to do and we're like, you know, I'm not really sure what to do, we we like to bring up to our patrons. So we just want to say thank you to them and they've been super super helpful to us. Yeah, um, they're actually going to help us name this live stream. So next time we'll have a right. actual name for the live stream. So thanks guys. That's right. And um, Desiree actually told me before that she was going to oh, no. um, thank you guys through a haiku, oh. which I will remind Desiree <laughs> is generally five syllables followed by seven syllables followed by five syllables. Oh gosh. So five, seven, five? Five, seven, five. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Everyone really appreciates it. Uh, thank you very much. You guys rock my world a lot. Nice. <laughs> um, please come back again. <laughs> well done. Thanks. And also, uh, we've got a little uh, competition right now going on our Facebook page. Uh, we had a bunch of photos from uh, Key West, the uh, kind of underworld, underwater world of Key West. So we thought to make it fun, we would uh, open up a competition to see who can identify different species of uh, sea life. And um, we've got Patty Gray, Sherry Meltzer, and Maricela Meltzer, uh, Kelsey Haas, Scuba Tony, Thomas Golan, Joe Fish, and Ken Ferrari so far are our winners. And we're going to enter them in a drawing to win one of the koozies from our wedding. So um, yeah, check out our Facebook page. Real quick, I just want to give a shout out to Boatworks today. Uh, I, I you, you commented a, a minute ago. I hope you're still on here, but uh, I absolutely love your videos. All of you guys, if you're, if you're considering refitting a sailboat, if you're in the middle of a refit, or if you're just trying to, you've got a boat that's already refit and you're doing a lot of different projects, Boatworks today has amazing videos. He cuts to the chase and I mean, really you can learn a lot from watching those videos. Uh, also, I wanted to give a shout out to Don Trader. Don Trader is here. They own an Allied Sea Wind as well, mm. and uh, I, we've I've seen you guys on the internet as well, and it's it's wonderful to have you guys. We'd love to talk to you guys uh, later on about all this. All fun right, stuff. and tune in next week. We've been doing uh, our live streams at 6 p.m., but we're gonna bump it up to 7 p.m. so that maybe some people on the West Coast can piggyback on. Um, so yeah, check us out next week at 7 p.m. Monday, and we're gonna be talking about passage planning. So uh, we've decided with our patrons that. Um, we're not going to try to cross the Pacific this year, so we have a whole year of sailing to plan, uh, and we've been doing it, so we thought we'd share with you kind of our process. Very exciting. Yeah. Colin Jacobs, you're the man, buddy. Oh, Aww. I can't wait to see you next time. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Well, I guess that's it. That's the new. So long, farewell, Alvita's an adieu.